Hello everyone, today I am here with the fourth installment of the Bread Science video series, and I will be discussing rye flour, which I often use in my bread baking. While conducting research online for this video, I discovered that there's actually quite a bit of conflicting information on rye flour, especially in terms of rye flour proteins, and also that there is generally less information on rye flour as opposed to wheat flour. So I definitely feel like there's a lack of clear and consistent uh, information on rye flour, but my hope with today's video is to highlight some interesting qualities about rye flour, as well as characterize it in a way that can help differentiate it from wheat flour. Rye flour is popular in certain types of breads and in sourdough bread baking due to its influence on the bread's flavor and its contributions to fermentation. So I do highly encourage all of you to experiment with rye flour if it is available to you where you live. So an outline for today's presentation. This picture on the right hand side shows a wheat uh, sourdough starter and a rye sourdough starter. And if you would like to see some of the visual differences between uh, rye and wheat starters and what kind of happens during their fermentation and the different textures within each of them, I highly encourage you to check out my sourdough starter feeding video and you can see how these flours are differentiated when they are hydrated. The outline for today's presentation includes defining what rye is, a discussion of different rye flours around the world, characterizing rye and its proteins, sugars, and enzyme activity, and how those influence bread making with rye, and finally, a look at rye in sourdough baking. So what is rye? Rye is a grass that is a source of grain similar to wheat. It is a member of the Triticiae or Triticiae tribe, along with wheat and barley, meaning that rye is closely related to both wheat, which is a member of the genus Triticum, and barley, which is a member of the genus Hordeum. Rye grains are used in a variety of uh, food and alcohol production. For example, they are used to make bread, beer, some whiskeys, and certain types of vodka. Rye grains can be eaten whole, either as boiled rye berries or by being rolled, similar to rolled oats. Uh, similar to wheat flours, rye grains do contain endosperm, bran, and germ. Therefore, you can purchase flours with different proportions of these components. For example, you can purchase whole grain rye flour or fine rye flour. Now to discuss rye flours, which as shown with this image can range from highly refined white or light rye flours um, to actual whole rye grains that can be sold. Unlike with wheat flours, with rye flour you won't really get similar labels. For example, you won't really find a cake or pastry rye flour or a bread rye flour. Instead, you'll often see a differentiation between light to medium to dark rye flours or from finely ground to coarsely ground or whole rye berries that are sold. However, the amount and varieties of rye flours that you will find really depends on where you live and, and whether or not rye is uh, accessible where you live. For example, in the US and Canada, which I've primarily lived in for most of my life, I often see one and maximum two rye flours being sold. Typically, they are light or dark rye flours. For example, in Canada, I have exclusively seen dark rye flours being sold. Uh, a light rye flour is similar to an all-purpose wheat flour, um, although it won't necessarily be described as an all-purpose flour. And these light rye flours uh, generally have most of the germ in the bran removed, so they're primarily the endosperm of the grain, and they tend to be low in protein and high in starch, whereas a dark rye flour usually contains the bran and the germ of the rye grain, and it's usually made from milling the whole rye grain. So to simplify it, a light rye flour can be considered a light, fluffy, almost all-purpose rye flour, and a dark rye flour is considered more of a whole grain rye flour. So to look a little bit more into rye flour in the US and Canada, as shown in the previous slide, there's a huge variety of potential rye flours. However, you don't really see these in most grocery stores or supermarkets in the US and Canada. Typically, there's a very limited selection. And as mentioned, I've almost exclusively seen uh, dark, coarse grain rye flours, like the brands that you see here. For example, Anita's and Rogers are very popular brands in Canada, whereas Hodgson Mill is more popular in the United States. And as you can see, they're mostly whole grain or dark rye flowers.
As opposed to Canada and the United States, certain countries have a wide variety of rye flowers. For example, in Germany there are eight common rye flowers. Not all of them will be available in all of the supermarkets or regular markets, but um, you'll see a mix of the white or light rye flowers to the dark to the very whole grain rye flowers. And so there's a lot more um, options and varieties to choose from if you live in countries like this. So to go into more details about German rye flowers, which is the example that I'm using in this case, their rye flower classification is quite specific. As you can see, there are eight different types of rye flower, and they're essentially differentiated based off of ash or mineral content. What is ash or mineral content, you may be asking? Well, it is the amount of ash or mineral that is left over after burning or incinerating a flower. For example, if you burn 100 grams of rye flour and there's one gram of material remaining after burning it, then that flour is 1% ash. Whole grain rye flours tend to have higher ash content because the bran, germ, and the outer endosperm that are present in those whole grain flours tend to contain more minerals, so therefore they yield a higher ash content. So you can kind of see ranging from flower type 815 to type 1800, there is an increase in ash content as the flower tends to be more coarsely ground and contain more of the whole rye grain. And therefore, because these have different ash contents and they have different textures and functionality, they tend to be used for different kinds of rye bread. For example, type 815 tends to be used for light rye breads, whereas type 1150 tends to be used for medium to dark rye breads. And then as you get to more coarsely ground rye flours, they are good for more whole grain rye breads, like a traditional German pumpernickel. And sometimes you'll even see breads, actually often you can see breads um, such as Volkornbrot, I might not be pronouncing that correctly, but that type of bread can actually include whole hydrated rye, rye berries as part of the actual dough itself. So this is just an example to showcase that certain countries have a much broader variety of rye flowers that are available. Oh, and this figure, uh, or this picture on the right hand side is showing somebody placing a crucible of material into a very hot furnace to determine the ash or mineral content. So why are there so many kinds of rye flour in Germany? Well, because rye is extremely popular in Eastern and Northern European baking. And part of the reason why that is, is because rye tends to grow better in cooler climates. And if you can see these maps on the bottom here, on the left hand side, we have the primary places where rye is grown and it is, and it is in Northern and Eastern Europe, whereas wheat is grown in a greater variety of areas because they can tolerate different climates a bit better than rye. Furthermore, rye is very culturally and historically important in Eastern and Northern Europe. Therefore, it's been used for centuries in these countries, and these breads are very popular and in certain cases can be considered healthy and hearty breads in these areas. A lot of rye that is used around the world is typically exported from Germany and Poland. So one of the reasons why rye is very popular in Eastern and Northern European baking is because of the long-standing traditions of not only growing rye, but also baking with rye. Um, rye is often used in mixed or 100% rye breads in these areas and tends to produce extremely flavorful breads, especially when they are fermented for a long time prior to baking. It's important to note that these countries in Europe aren't the only countries that use rye flour, but rye is extremely popular here. So now I am moving on to the rye characterization section of this presentation, where I will discuss rye in a little bit more scientific detail. If you've ever worked with rye flour, you're probably thinking that it sounds absolutely crazy to make a bread that is 100% rye flour because it creates such a sticky dough that acts almost more like a batter than a normal wheat dough, which tends to be more firm and elastic. So I will discuss why rye is so dang sticky. And there are three major reasons, and I will discuss each one um, in depth in future slides. Those three reasons being the gluten proteins that are found in rye flour, as well as the sugars and the amylase enzymes that are present in rye.
So gluten, as discussed in my previous bread science videos, is often thought to be mainly comprised of glutenin and gliadin, which, when hydrated, can form gluten. However, different cereal grains, such as rye, contain different kinds of protein. Um, gluten, for example, is considered a storage protein, but when we consider rye, rye grains contain a high amount of secalin, or secalin, as you can see here, which is another form of stor storage protein like gluten. Um, I will refer to these as secalins, but they might also be pronounced secalin. Uh, secalins are similar in structure or function to glutenin and gliadin, but lack the, the cohesiveness and the elasticity that can help build bread structure like gluten can. So therefore, secalin kind of functions differently than gluten. Then if we see in this figure here, which is a figure that I have shown in a previous bread science video, along with secalin, Rye may also contain glutenin and gliadin, which form gluten. However, I really wanted to point out with this uh, list here, which is that when I was going through my sources of trying to find more information out about the proteins in rye, there was a lot of different information that was available and conflicting information that was available. And I searched different kinds of sources from standard everyday sources and sources of information to actual scientific papers, but either these papers didn't discuss rye in great detail or what they did discuss conflicted with another source. But these are the main viewpoints that I saw in my research. The first being that rye contains only secalin and contains no gliadin or glutenin. The second point that I saw was that rye contains secalin and lots of gliadin, but no glutenin. The third point that I saw was that uh, rye can contain lots of gliadin, but minimal glutenin if it does contain gluten proteins. And the fourth point of view that I saw was that rye contains secalin and gluten, both of which contain gliadin. So overall, it was kind of confusing trying to figure out what is, what is actually going on with rye. And I think part of this may be because there's not as much research on rye as there is in wheat, at least in what information was available to me because I mainly research online through publicly accessible information, whereas there might be different countries and information that's available maybe in different languages or different fields of science that I perhaps just don't have access to or, aren't, or are not able to read. And so therefore, if any of you that are watching can figure out what is going on with the proteins in rye and can clear this up for me and the rest of our audience, I will most likely make another short video on the actual answer here of what proteins are going on or what proteins are um, occurring in rye specifically. So although there's conflicting research and conflicting information about the proteins in rye, the main conclusion that I made based off of my research was that it seemed as though the most uh, supported result was that rye does contain secalin, that seems to be a known fact, which is a gluten protein but is not the same as gluten and that gliadin is a component of that secalin. Therefore, another point that I saw was that glutenin may be present in rye, but only in small or minimal amounts. So it seems as though secalin is the main protein in rye, and it's highly debated whether or not gluten is also present in rye, and whether or not gliadin and glutenin are present. But if the one source that stated that gliadin in rye is much higher than the amount of glutenin. This might partly explain why rye is so sticky because if we see in this figure here, when there's a lot of gliadin, the rye or the, the dough is very, very stretchy and sort of can extend a long ways. But with the glutenin, that's what actually provides that elasticity or that strength. So even though it can stretch, it can also bounce back. And so without a lot of glutenin, which may be the case in rye, this might explain why it is very sticky and stretchy, but not necessarily elastic like a wheat dough. And to discuss that a little bit more scientifically, so glutenin on its own provides that strength and elasticity, whereas gliadin contributes to the viscosity, cohesiveness, and extensibility of the dough. Therefore, when gliadin is hydrated, it acts like a viscous liquid that imparts that extensibility to the dough, which makes the dough sticky. And the fact that there may be more gliadin in rye makes it more sticky and extensible, but not necessarily strong. Uh, therefore, rye doughs can actually struggle to hold the gas that is produced by the yeast during fermentation, that's CO2, and other gases that are produced during fermentation, which may be the reason why rye bread tends to be 
um, tends not to hold as, ma as many big bubbles as a wheat bread, for example. So to move on from the proteins in rye to the sugars in the starch in rye, rye flour actually does contain more sugars than wheat flour, meaning that it contains more free sugar than wheat flour, which can enhance fermentation in, in doughs with rye flour. And these are complex sugars, which are called pentosins, and they are particularly high in rye, although they are present in other flours. For example, wheat flours, and in particular whole wheat flours, or wheat flours with a lot of wheat bran, also contain a lot, of, a lot of pentosins. And I will pull up this figure here, which compares wheat flours or wheat bran on the left-hand side, and rye flour and rye bran on the right-hand side. And what you can see is the difference in the amount of water-soluble pentosins between the wheat and the rye. It's important to note that these pentosin sugars actually compete with rye proteins for water meaning that the pentosins are hydroscopic, similar to a sugar that you would add to a normal wheat bread dough. And when pentosins are broken apart uh, during mixing and fermentation of a bread dough, this can actually make the dough stickier. Therefore, it's not just the rye proteins that are making a rye dough sticky, it's also the sugars that are present in that dough. Something that's also important to note is that there is a difference between water-soluble and insoluble pentosins in rye. So, soluble pentosins are considered easier to digest and ferment, not only for humans, but also for the yeast and the bacteria that are present in your bread dough. So the fact that rye has more soluble pentosins than wheat can actually influence the fermentation if, you contain, if your dough contains rye flour. Furthermore, the solubility of the pentosins can actually make the dough more viscous. So, essentially these pentosins in the rye flour will absorb water and swell, which makes the dough sticky and gummy. However, this can actually help to build dough cohesiveness and to help build bread structure. Therefore, the sugars in the rye flour as well as the proteins in the rye flour are helping to build structure within a rye bread. Finally, because these pentosins absorb water, this can actually help keep the bread moist longer after baking, meaning that the rye bread will actually tend to dry out more slowly. Alright, now to move on from the starches and the sugar in rye to the enzymes in rye. So to reference back to the first bread science video, here I have the example that I used of an enzymatic chain uh, during wheat dough fermentation, where we have enzymes like amylase, maltase, zymase, and invertase breaking down the starches and sugars during fermentation. And so if we consider rye flour, rye flour contains a lot of amylase, um, which is that enzyme that's breaking down that starch into maltose, which can then be processed into other sugars. Therefore, because rye contains quite a bit of amylase, when it is hydrated and while it is fermenting, the amylase can actually be um, quite active, and in fact, in some cases, it can actually become overactive. And when the am amylase is too active, it creates too many sugars, and that can contribute to the stickiness and potential gumminess of the rye uh, dough, and it can influence its structure quite a bit. So it's not always ideal to have too much amylase activity if you are working with a rye dough. And it's also important to note that that amylase is another one of those factors, along with the rye proteins and those pentosins that are in the rye that influence rye stickiness. However, even though amylase can threaten the dough stick stickiness and structure, it's important to remember that enzymes are influenced by temperature and pH, and that amylases tend to slow down at a low or acidic pH. Therefore, if you're fermenting your dough in an, in an acidic environment, such as a sourdough environment, or just a particularly acidic bread, um, this can actually slow down that amylase activity um, as well as refrigerating the dough, and that can sort of slow down the fermentation, but also enhance flavor without losing too much structure of the resulting rye bread. So you really want to consider the influence that fermentation has on rye, especially because since it is so sticky, it can be harder to track um, whether or not it has fermented properly or over-fermented compared, compared to a wheat dough, because a wheat dough you can tell that it's rising and falling. So it can be tricky to track fermentation with rye, and it's something to keep in mind that you don't want to enhance the amylase activity too much. So now to consider the importance of resting a rye bread. If you have a dough that has a particularly high percent of rye flour, 
um, it can actually be detrimental to cut into it too early, which is also a problem with wheat breads. But in particular with rye, you can notice that the texture can be quite gummy and that it might actually be better to rest the bread for a day or two uh, before cutting into it. And remember, this is for very high percentage rye breads. Um, and the reason why that is and the reason why I want to wait usually is because those sugars have absorbed a lot of water, the proteins have absorbed water, and so the texture can be gummy and needs to sort of rest and let the water redistribute and soften the crust a little bit and just overall the texture improves. Not only that, the flavor can also improve with resting time. And so there's actually some um, sort of general recommendations. For example, if your bread contains over 60% rye flour, it is best to rest it for about 24 hours before cutting into it. And then if you have 100% rye, you should probably rest it for 48 to 72, that is two to three days um, before cutting into it, just to let that water redistribute and hopefully let the flavors kind of develop. And don't worry, the rye breads in particular can be quite flavorful and delicious and hold on to that moisture potentially longer than, than wheat doughs or wheat breads um, in some cases. So even though you're letting it rest a long time, don't be afraid that it's going to dry out substantially. Um, it should be okay in most cases. The purpose of this slide is to showcase different kinds of rye breads that I've made. And although I don't have extensive experience baking with rye, um, I just wanted to share a little bit of my experience. Um, so here we have a 40% rye bread on the very uh, left-hand side. And these were just little rye buns that I made when I was in Germany. Um, these were made with a poolish or sort of overnight yeast starter. And then the rye, uh, the rye bread in the middle is about 66% rye. Um, and as you can see, the dough is a bit sticky. I mean, the dough is sticky in, in all cases, but it's a little bit less sticky than, than your 70 to 100%, for example. But the 66% rye bread was made with sourdough and a little bit of yeast just to kind of get it going and to speed up the process. Um, and this is considered, I, I believe it was considered a farmer's bread, a farmer's rye bread. Um, and I tried to follow, follow as, as traditional of German recipes as I could, even though German is certainly not my first language. Um, and then the one we have on the furthest right hand side, this was actually one of the most tricky breads that I've ever made. I think it took me four attempts to get something close to what I had actually eaten in Germany. And it's that sort of Volkorn brat, that really heavy, hearty. I don't think it's always made with whole grain rye. I think actually Volkorn brat might mostly be made with whole grain wheat or I think einkorn flour. But I think what I had from my local bakery was mostly rye because it had sort of a strong flavor, lots of seeds and nuts in it. It was very moist. It had almost like a little bit of a beery, yeasty, t yeasty taste, but it was also a little bit sour. So I went through, I think, four different recipes and made so many dense loaves of bread before I found one that I, that actually mimicked that like intense, fermented, almost slightly beery, alcoholic rye bread that I had when I was living in northern Germany. And I really don't want to offend any Germans or fans of rye breads. I know that I'm not very experienced with these, so I won't say that I'm an expert, but these are just some of the rye breads that I've baked. And I wanted to give this as sort of a visual of kind of the different textures and different varieties that I've personally experienced. And as you've probably seen in my sourdough feeding video, I actually love using rye in my, as my sourdough starter, but I don't use a ton of rye in the, my sourdough breads otherwise. For example, I'll use it in the sourdough starter, but then the rest of the flour will be usually bread flour and whole wheat flour. However, I do think the rye really adds a lot of flavor and also just like a different community of um, sourdough bacteria and yeast rather than just a wheat starter. And I think that perhaps the interaction between the wheat flours and what uh, bacteria and yeast are present in my rye starter creates sort of just an interesting flavor combination. I can't really describe it and I wish I had more scientific detail to help you understand it, but I do really love using a rye sourdough starter for my uh, wheat sourdough breads. So obviously I love using rye in sourdough baking, whether I'm making a rye bread specifically or just using it for my, um, my sourdough breads in general. And so I wanted to include a slide that contains quite a bit of information about using rye in sourdough baking. And it does influence sourdough in various ways. For example, uh, sourdough or using rye in sourdough influences the structure of the rye breads via the fermentation process. Um, because when you're fermenting with sourdough, 
This can trigger the acidification of the dough, which can cause those rye proteins, which are acetylene, to swell and hold water, which can actually help the bread maintain structure. So essentially, the acidic nature of sourdough is helping those rye proteins to actually hold more water and to help the, belt, the bread build structure. And as mentioned, we have those pentosin sugars that are present in rye, as well as that amylase enzyme that influences the bread structure and starch breakdown, as well as the water retention in these doughs. But it's important to note that the pentosins that are in rye flour also attract yeast and sourdough bacteria and can help to build a strong sourdough starter community that may not necessarily be the same community that you'll find in a wheat uh, sourdough starter or sourdough bread. And because these rye doughs are also rich in amylase, they can enhance that sugar breakdown during fermentation, which can, um, which can actually provide more sugar for those sourdough yeast and bacterial communities, which can enhance colonization and propagation and speed up fermentation in rye doughs. I feel like this is a lot of information, but just bear with me. Um, some research also indicates that the amylase that is present in rye flour is actually different from amylase in wheat flour and may actually be able to survive the baking process a bit longer and a bit better than in wheat bread. However, this could be slightly problematic because if we have amylase that's active longer in a rye bread than a wheat bread, then that longer activity of amylase can destroy more starch and potentially negatively impact that bread structure as I described in a previous slide. However, again, as mentioned before, the low pH can inhibit that amylase. So even though rye tends to have more amylase activity and more amylase in general, sourdough can decrease the pH in a way that sort of slows down that amylase activity and prevents us from over-fermenting and negatively influencing the bread structure. Another important thing to note and is important for most people who are consuming rye bread is that it does influence the flavor of the dough. Um, whether you're using sourdough or not. In fact, I've made rye breads that aren't sourdough and actually taste more sour just because rye was in them compared to just a wheat bread. And so it's important to note that rye does actually contribute a different flavor to, uh, or then wheat to different kinds of bread. And because it can taste a little bit sour, it can enhance the overall experience of different kinds of bread. Although I don't, I don't claim to be a doctor or anything or a health, uh, nutritionist or anything like that. Uh, something I did read a little bit about was that rye flour can be considered more nutritious than wheat flour, um, but rye flour can actually contain more soluble fiber and tends to contain a complete amino acid profile as opposed to wheat flour. But I will, again, I will not go into the health details in general because I don't want to be cited as a health resource or a dietitian because I'm not. But these are just some of the things that I read about the health benefits of rye flour. All right, finally, we are at the conclusion of this presentation. So just to summarize and to reiterate, I realize that some points I've made several times in this video and I'm about to make them again, but I just wanna make sure that I drive these points home about the different proteins, uh, starches, and the amylase activity in rye bread. So to summarize, rye proteins do differ from wheat proteins, um, especially in the case of the fact that it is considered that rye proteins are primarily succulent and that rye may or may not contain gluten or components of gluten, such as gliadin and glutenin. And again, we have that the starch composition of rye differs from other grains, such as wheat, and that this starch composition, which includes those pentosin sugars, um, influences the water absorption of rye breads, or rye doughs and rye breads, and also helps in building the rye bread structure. Furthermore, fermenting rye, especially via sourdough, can actually help improve the quality and the rise and the flavor of the bread and perhaps the longevity of the bread as well. And so my takeaway message for this presentation is that you really should experiment more with rye flour, even just if it's just a little bit more at a time, like take a lean dough and just add a little bit of rye flour or experiment with trying to make a rye sourdough starter because it can influence fermentation and it can potentially really improve your bread's flavor. And so in conclusion, I would thank you all for watching. And again, if you have more information about these confusing rye proteins and what is going on there, or just any comments or things you would like to learn more about, please comment below and let me know what you'd like to listen to or see next.